At a time when experts are being ignored and alternative facts are being touted as reality, publications like The Economist are only becoming more vital. With a readership of more than one and a half million, it's at the forefront of the global conversation. Zani Minton Beddoes is an award winning financial journalist who became the magazine's first female editor in 2015. Currently on a speaking tour of the United States, she started by talking to our Walter Isaacson about the Brexit vote and what it really represents. Welcome to America and your tour here. Let's start with Brexit. Why is all this happening? Why did Brexit pass? <laughs> why did Brexit, why did the referendum pass? Well, it was a combination of things. Um, I think there were a group of people in the British Conservative Party who for decades had been unhappy with Britain being part of the European Union. And it had been a sort of festering sore within the Conservative Party. And David Cameron, the prime minister at the time, decided that putting this issue to a referendum would kind of lance that boil, if you will, and deal with a problem in his party. And he and everybody around him was fully expecting to win the referendum. It was not something that was high on the agenda of most people in the UK. In fact, if you look at polls before the referendum, it was nowhere near the top. People worried about the National Health Service. They worried about all manner of things, but not Brexit. But that the, the referendum itself became a vehicle through which many people voiced profound frustration. It was a protest vote. It was a vote of anger, not dissimilar to many of the people who voted for President Trump in 2016. It was a vote not necessarily for anything in particular. It was just a kind of, I'm fed up with the status quo. And there's an interesting English adage that the, the, the sort of constellation of people who voted for Brexit were these generally affluent conservative voters and then a lot of blue-collar workers who, who were angry and felt left behind. And so uh, it's often said that it, it was a collection, it was a, it was a coordination of blue collars and red trousers, because those <laughs> conservative uh, types often wear, often wear red trousers. But so it was this protest vote. But since then, what's really striking is that it has become the fault line in British politics. I mean, it's now people identify much more about whether they are a Remainer or a Brexiter than they do about whether they are conservative or Labour. In Britain, do you think there might be a realignment somehow, since the parties don't represent the political fault well, lines? Well, it's certainly possible. I mean, there has already been somewhat of a realignment in the sense that the Conservative Party has become much more of a populist nationalist party than the kind of Which is more a little moderate, bit like what happened here. Which is what, like what happened here. The Labour Party has been essentially hijacked by a far-left group of people. And you know, Jeremy Corbyn, who is the leader of the British Labour Party, is by far the most left-wing leader we've had in the Labour Party, at least since the 1930s. I mean, he really is a Marxist, or close to be, and he's surrounded by Trotskyists. So this is a, a far-left cabal that have taken over, you know, what was traditionally a sort of centre-left party under Tony Blair. And the irony is, if you hadn't had that takeover of the Labour Party, we probably would have seen the whole referendum debate play out very differently. So it's because these two earthquakes have taken place in the two parties at the same time that we have British politics where it is. And I think you're right that it is possible that we will see a fracturing because centrist remain voters, people who are, who are not in favor of leaving the European Union and are centrist, really don't have anywhere to go right now. But they do with the Social Democratic Party. They, did with the, they do with the Liberal Democrats. Liberal, liberal Democrats. Why they, doesn't that rise up? And the, it is, you know, we may see at the next election a very big rise in the number of seats for the Liberal Democrats. But the problem with the British political system, which, as you know, is first past the post system, it's actually very, very hard to break through, for, for smaller parties to break through. So you can get a lot of votes, but still not get very many seats. But when you have all the parties where they are now, which is broadly the mid-30s, the Conservative Party polling, and then the 20s for, for Labour and the Lib Dems slightly below that, we could see a very big reshuffling of British politics. It's going to be one of... The next election is going to be one of the most exciting <laughs> elections in modern British history, because you're right, we, we could throw the whole deck of cards up and get something very different. The centre isn't holding, as you say. The centre's not holding in the United States. The centre's not holding across Europe and much of the Western world. What happened to this sort of force that used to keep us gravitating towards the centre? It's a really good question, and I think political scientists for the next decade are going to be grappling with this. And the, the sort of simple answer that we keep hearing is it's the rise of populism, which is true, but I think it's more of a description than it is an explanation. The fact that this is happening 
in this country, in, in Britain, as you say, across Europe. In each case, there are some individual idiosyncratic reasons, but I think the fact that we have this anger and frustration in so many countries at the same time suggests to me that there are deeper causes. And, and I've been thinking about this a bit, and it, it strikes me that there are four, um, four big shocks that we're going through right now in the world economy, and each of them is enough to make people anxious and, and worry about the future. So one is the whole computer revolution, the technological revolution. As you, you know much better than many, I mean, we are at the beginning, middle of this, probably, huge change in the nature of our economy, of our society from that change. People feeling anxious, you know, majorities of people now across the, the advanced world think that their kids are going to be worse off than they are. People are worried about the future of work. So that's one big shock. The second is I think we're in the midst of this very big geopolitical shift. The, the, the late latter half of the 20th century, the U.S. was the undisputed mm -hmm. global leader. Now we have, in the form of China, you know, a rising power. It's going to have the world's biggest economy in the not-too-distant future. And it's an authoritarian dictatorship, an authoritarian regime that's becoming more authoritarian the more it rises. That's a big power shift, um, a big challenge to the U.S. that I think is also a second big shock. Third one is the demographic shock. Populations are aging. We're all living longer. The com combination of rising life expectancy and declining fertility means that the kind of the nature of society is changing as populations age. And the, the median age is rising pretty dramatically across much of the world. And then the fourth one, and this I think is, you know, this country has been a little slower on than others, but I think climate change is going to be the other defining shock of the, of the next few decades, because we're seeing the impact in the form of more extreme weather patterns. We're also seeing in the younger generation a kind of creed occur, and, mm -hmm. you know, for goodness sake, address this. And you put all of those together, they're all profound shocks to the established political system, the sort of post-war system. And the people who tend to read The Economist, tend to at least know about Davos and stuff, they believed, as I think I did and you did, although I'm having second thoughts, that free trade, immigration, technology were all going to be good for the economy. And yet, I'm looking at your new cover, you know, Elizabeth Warren's plan to remake capitalism. We're looking at Trump. We're looking at Brexit. It seems that people have lost faith in capitalism being able to distribute the goods of a growing economy fairly. You're right. And I think a lot of people are losing faith. And there is a there are really big problems that haven't been addressed and that need to be addressed. I, and I, I welcome bold thinking to do that. And we, as you see, the, in, in, in that issue of The Economist, we had a long, hard look at Elizabeth Warren's plan, which is breathtaking in its scope. And, and in an era where, you know, it, there's a lot of policy by tweet, it's incredibly impressive to have a sort of planned program of that scale. On balance, I think, she probably gets more things wrong than she gets right. Is she the, the the she identifies a lot of the right challenges, but overall, her particular proposals, you know, some of them would be good, but some of them would have quite dramatic negative consequences. But I applaud the kind of I think the bold thinking is exactly what we need to do. I'd rather have sort of bold incrementalism than <laughs> reckless radicalism. But hey, it's it, you're right. There is. There are important things that, that need to change and that need to be looked at. And that's, that's the, the, the silver lining in this period of political turmoil. At the moment, we see a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of scapegoating, and a lot of, you know, snake oil salesmen pretending that there are easy answers. You know, I don't think tariffs are the answer. I don't think protectionism is the answer. I don't think a drawbridge up kind of mentality is the answer. But we do need to think about what is a positive uh, agenda forward, and what is a kind of positive vision for a 21st century U.S.? And over the next few years, I think that's what this country is going to be grappling towards. How old's the Economist? More than 176 70 years. years. Now. We were founded in 1843. And in that period, it has always stood for sort of free minds, free markets, free trade, not that ideological, but believing in what are the fundamentals of what I'll call classic, liberal, democratic, capitalism, free markets. What would you do now to fix that system? 
Well, that's exactly right. We've been, we've been, we stand for the classic English liberalism. And I, whenever I use the word liberal in the U.S., I have to kind of, you know, preface it by saying classic English yeah. liberalism because mm -hmm. it has a different meaning here: individual freedom, economic and political. I think that we need to have a very hard rethink about what, you know, liberalism in the 21st century looks like. Actually, last year was our 175th anniversary, and we marked our anniversary. Um, with a cover story and, a, and an essay on remaking liberalism, which and I took, actually wrote that essay and sort of spent some weeks in the summer writing it last year, and so went through in some detail the areas that you know were required. And I think the you know part of it is unleashing genuine competition, and and that's actually something that Elizabeth Warren talks about. I'm not sure that her specifics reach it, but we've got an economy increasingly concentrated in this country big business increasingly building moats around. We need to kind of have a renewed focus on competition. We so need that's antitrust. Yeah, a 21st century antitrust policy, a, a kind of pragmatic approach to immigration, which is not complete open borders, but not draw bridge up. There needs to be, I think, as we look forward, the underlying demographics of many countries mean that they will need more immigration, but we need to find ways to make that immigration politically sustainable. It means, I think, in a geopolitical sense, the U.S. and China reaching a strategic, mutually um, underst a strategic understanding that they can work together. Because one of the great strengths of the post-war order was that the U.S. built up a system which the U.S. led that was the multilateral, open, outward-looking system. That needs to be modified in the in an era of a rising China. But we need to find what that what the new um, equilibrium there is. So there's a, a whole load of areas where we need reform, bold reform. The welfare state needs to be rethought. When we're all living longer, pension systems need rethinking. Tax systems need rethinking. You know, the rich do need to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are different ways of doing it, better or worse, but bold rethinking. And I think part of the problem for, you know, the, the economist reader, if you will, um, is that many people who have done very well out of this system um, out of a system they consider to be meritocratic, the highly skilled, the highly educated, are actually probably less inclined for bold reforms than they like to admit that they are. You talk about the uh, sort of competition between classic liberal free market democracy on one hand and China's rise in its authoritarian state. We've seen a lot of pushback recently, even with the NBA Basketball League, pushing back on China's authoritarianism. Do you think that's part of the future of what the West needs to do? Yeah, I think that the West needs to stand up for what it believes in. And I think, therefore, it's important to call out human rights abuses. It's important to stand up for, you know, Western ideals, even if China is an enormous market. And so I think that there is, you know, clearly one area of increasing tension is that China now, you know, increasingly doesn't, not only won't countenance criticism of what it does internally, it wants no criticism in the rest of the world of what it does internally. And I think that is a fault line, and it's one where the West needs to stand up for what it believes How in. How does The Economist deal with China and have to work through its censorship problems? Well, we are, the, our website is banned in China. Our app is often banned. Um, you know, we write what we think is right. Um, and it's, you know, quite often they don't like it very much. One of the cool things about The Economist over the years uh, is the covers. And they're always clever, maybe even, as the British would say, too clever by half. It takes you a moment to figure them out. One of the covers that was most striking this year was your special issue on climate change. Describe that cover and that special issue, what was driving you. So we decided it was the first time we've ever done a special issue where we had in every section of the newspaper, we call it a newspaper, mm -hmm. in every section of the newspaper, we had a piece about climate change. And we had a big, we had an editorial, we had a big explanatory briefing, and it was, we had a special logo. The reason we did that was to show that every aspect of our world, so every aspect of what we cover will be influenced by climate change. And it, it, it was not the only thing that we wrote about, there were other things, but it was through, infused throughout, throughout The Economist that week. And the cover, which was a, a colleague of mine who suggested the idea, was a very bold graphic that showed, in, through, through colored stripes, how the world's temperature had risen. 
So it was the temperature of the world relative to an average, um, showing that it had kind of warmed quite substantially um, over the past 150 years. And it, it, it showed, because it was basically blue, 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 red, red, red on the right-hand side. It showed very powerfully what had gone on with, the, with global temperature. And it was a, it's an unusual cover for us. We don't usually... And it was do somewhat of an advocacy cover more than The Economist has done in sure pushing climate. I'm not sure it was an advocacy cover. I think it was, it was pushing the subject. What was, what was very important to me, and, and if you read the editorial, you would sure. have seen, is that it was very clearly saying that this uh, issue, the, the fact that the climate is, is changing, is going to affect every aspect of life on this planet over the coming decades. But that dealing with it, which requires a profound shift from mm -hmm. energy, carbon, energy that comes from carbon to energy that doesn't, that has to, in my view, the only way we will do that is by harnessing the innovative power of capitalism to do it. And part of the, my frustration with the current climate debate is that many climate activists, those people who are more focused on what's happening with the climate, are also then saying that the evils of capitalism and the evils of economic growth have led to this. And I think that that is, at some point, a kind of dead end of a conversation. The only way we're going to, um, as a planet, address climate change, and if we don't, to be clear, it's not necessarily... It's not going to be existential for the whole planet, but it is going to affect hundreds of millions of people as the Earth warms and as we see the, the ever more you know, frequent extreme weather events. But to, to counter that, you have to harness the innovative power of capitalism. You yes. have to... You have to have all of the elements that The Economist stands for of, of free markets harnessed to help do that. And, and we can do that. So it was not an advocacy issue. It was an explanatory issue. And the whole tone of it... And, and if it wasn't this, then, then, then we mm -hmm. failed. Our goal was very much to, to kind of lay out the comprehensive nature of what was happening, but do so in a kind of fact-based, rational, analytical way. Thank you for being with us, Annie. Thank you. Appreciate it.